this is video lecture number 74. Today we are looking at intellectual modernism. Uh, we have two subsections today. The first is Harlem in Vogue, and the second is Critiquing American Life. So we often think of the 1920s in terms of the decade's writers and other creative individuals, uh, some of them disillusioned by the Great War and the materialism of the post-war decade, uh, who contributed greatly and enduringly to American culture. Among them were Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Langston Hughes, John Dos Passos, Edith Wharton, Eugene O'Neill, Robert Frost, Marianne Moore, and William Faulkner. Uh, however, the decade was also noteworthy for the intensity of its cultural conflicts. Some of these were long-standing. Uh, others had originated in the Progressive Era or during and immediately after World War I. So let's jump in and have a closer look um, with our first subsection, Harlem in Vogue. As New York's black population tripled in the decade after 1910 uh, during the Great Migration, uh, Harlem stood as a symbol of hope to African-American people. Talented black artists and writers flocked to the district uh, where they broke with older genteel traditions and asserted ties to Africa. Writers and, art and artists of the Harlem Renaissance uh, championed race pride. Claude McKay, uh, Jean Toomer, and Jesse Fawcett uh, explored the black experience and represented in fiction what philosopher Alan Locke called the quote, New Negro. This creative work embodied the ongoing struggle to find a way, as the influential W.E.B. Du Bois explained, to quote, be both a Negro and an American. To millions of Americans, the most visible part of the Harlem Revolution was jazz. As a musical form, jazz coalesced in New Orleans and other parts of the South before World War I. Borrowing from blues, ragtime, and other popular forms, jazz musicians developed an ensemble style in which individual performers, keeping a rapid ragtime beat, improvised over and around a basic melodic line. The majority of early jazz musicians were black. Uh, but white performers, some of whom had more formal training, injected elements of European concert music. As jazz spread, it generally followed the routes of the great migration of blacks uh, from the south to northern and western cities, uh, where it met consumers who were primed to receive it. Before World War I, ragtime and other forms of dance music had created broad, enthusiastic audiences for African-American music. Most cities had plentiful venues where jazz could be featured. By the 1920s, radio had also helped popularize jazz as the emerging record industry churned out records of the latest tunes. New York became the hub of this commercially lucrative jazz, while listeners who hailed the quote primitive black music and seldom suspended their racial condescension when they went, quote, slumming to mixed race clubs. Uh, they flocked to theaters, ballrooms, and expensive clubs to hear the Harlem sound uh, from the orchestras of Duke Ellington and other stars. Through jazz, the recording industry began to develop products specifically aimed at urban working class blacks. While its marketing reflected the segregation of American society at large, uh, jazz brought black music to the center stage of American culture. It became the era's signature music, uh, so much so that novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald dubbed the 1920s the Jazz Age. It was no accident that the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, uh, which arose in the 1920s to mobilize African-American workers, was based in Harlem. Led by Jamaican-born Marcus Garvey, the UNIA championed black separatism. The charismatic Garvey urged followers to move to Africa, arguing that peoples of African descent would never be treated justly in white-run countries. The UNIA grew rapidly in the early 1920s and soon claimed four million followers, including many recent migrants to northern cities. It published a newspaper, 
uh, called Negro World, uh, opened Liberty Halls in northern cities, uh, and solicited funds for the Black Star Line Steamship Company to trade with the West Indies and carry American blacks back to Africa. But the UNIA declined as quickly as it had risen. In 1925, Garvey was imprisoned for mail fraud because of his solicitations for the Black Star Line. President Coolidge commuted his sentence, but ordered his deportation to Jamaica. Without Garvey's leadership, the movement collapsed. The UNIA then left a legacy of activism, especially among working class blacks. Garvey and his followers represented an emerging pan-Africanism. Uh, they argued that people of African descent in all parts of the world had a common destiny and should cooperate in political action. Black men's military service in Europe during World War I, uh, the Pan-African Congress that sought representation at the treaty table, uh, the U.S. occupation of Haiti, and modernist experiments in literature and all the arts uh, all contributed to this emerging transnational consciousness. Okay, let's go to the next section then, critiquing American life. Other American artists and intellectuals of the 1920s registered bitter dissents. Uh, some had experienced firsthand the shock and devastation of World War I, uh, an experience so searing that American writer Gertrude Stein dubbed those who survived it the lost generation. Novelist John Dos Passos railed at the obscenity of Mr. Wilson's War uh, in The Three Soldiers from 1921. Ernest Hemingway's novels The Sun Also Rises from 1926 and A Farewell to Arms from 29 portrayed the futility and dehumanizing consequences of war. In a broad sense, the cataclysm of World War I challenged intellectuals' beliefs in human progress. In his poem, The Wasteland, from 1922, T.S. Eliot evoked the shattered fragments, fragments of a civilization in ruins. The war accelerated a literary trend of exploring the dark side of the human psyche. Playwright Eugene O'Neill, for example, offered a Freudian view of humans' raw, ungovernable sexual impulses uh, in such dramas as Desire Under the Elms. O'Neill first made his mark with The Emperor Jones in 1920, which appealed to Americans' fascination with Haiti. In a decade of conflict uh, between uh, traditional and modern worldviews, many writers exposed what they saw as the hypocrisy of small town and rural life. The most savage critic of conformity was Sinclair Lewis, whose novel Babbitt in 1922 depicted the disillusionment of an ordinary small-town salesman. Uh, Babbitt was widely denounced as un-American. Elmer, Elmer Gantry, 27, uh, a satire of greedy evangelical mini a minister on the make, provoked even greater outrage. But critics found Lewis's work superb, and in 1930 he became the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Even more famous was F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby from 1925 which offered a scathing indictment of Americans' mindless pursuit for pleasure and material wealth. Okay, so that's it for today. Let's go ahead and answer the review questions at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.